All right, History 2111, U.S. History 1. Uh, this is Mr. Kennedy again. Uh, this is our first video. I hope you've gotten a chance to look at the welcome introductory video. If not, go back and watch that. Uh, this here is our first lecture video for the semester, and it's called Before First Contact. There are a couple of groups of people we're talking about, Native Americans, Europeans, and Africans. And for Native Americans, it's thought that the first Native American came here somewhere between 10,000 and 15,000 years ago. Although recently archeologists and anthropologists have thrown some questions into that. For now though, the general belief is that people came from Asia somewhere between 10 and 15,000 years ago along what was known as the Bering Land Bridge the water between Russia and Alaska used to be much more shallow. When the Ice Age was happening, it was actually shallow enough that you could walk from one continent to the other. And that's known as the Bering Land Bridge. Today it's known as the Bering Sea. It's very likely that these first indigenous people were following their prey and their food. Uh, most of the people, if not all of the people who lived 10 to 15,000 years ago, were what we would call hunter-gatherers, so they had to catch and find everything they ate. There was no agriculture. Agriculture is not established until about 7,000 years ago, and it's fairly recent on the historical timeline. Some of these indigenous people are fairly well advanced. For example, you have the Anasazi of the American Southwest, and they build canals and they build roads that were straight and miles and miles and miles long. And both the canals and the roads are used to connect villages together. Another indigenous culture group that you should know are the Mississippian. Uh, this is the culture group that used to live around here. Uh, for example, if you're familiar with the Creek people or even the Cherokee people, they're forms of the Mississippian native group. If you've ever been to the Etowah Indian Mounds in Cartersville, that was built by the Mississippian native group. Uh, these are going to be the people found along the Mississippi River Valley, where they get their name, and here in the southeast. And they were known for building cities that could hold thousands of people. And some very, very famous examples, the Etowah Indian Mounds, located near Cartersville. That's one of the places you can go on your museum review. Um, what remains now are six mounds and a village site. And it looks like that village site was active from about 1000 to 1500 AD. Further south near the city of Blakely, this is gonna be south of Albany and south of Columbus, uh, is the Kolomoki Indian Mounds. And Kolomoki is the earliest Mississippian site we have in the southeast. Uh, I've been there once, it's a fabulous place to visit, but there are eight mounds and it was the site of a village and it, we think it was around from about 350 to 600 AD. Now of all the Mississippian sites, the most famous one is Cahokia. It's near St. Louis. Uh, if you've ever been to St. Louis, it is on the east bank of the Mississippi River in what is today East St. Louis. If you go up into the St. Louis Arch and you look out the windows, you can actually look down and see it in the distance. Um, evidence shows that the Cahokia site was about six square miles. We think there were 40 to 50,000 people there. And we don't know where those people came from. We don't know where those people went. And one of your readings for this week is based on the Cahokia historical site. Native American culture, it's bound together by what we know as kinship groups. This is more of an anthropological idea more than a historical thing, but anthropology and history go very, very closely together. What we know about these Native American culture groups um, primarily related families, either by direct blood or by marriage. 
these related families grew larger and larger in size until these ethnic groups or these indigenous groups grew into what we uh, refer to as tribes today. These kinship groups are important because it helped the indigenous people establish their traditions, their rituals, their customs, their religion, you name it. In most Native American groups, uh, the gender roles are pretty equal. Uh, there's a little variation depending on where they are, but men and women have an equal position in society. Uh, men are often gone for longer periods of time. The women have to maintain the day-to-day -day household. Um, the one exception, though, is in religious matters. Most of the time, men are going to be in charge of religious ceremonies and uh, religious beliefs. Native American culture, by and large, uh, there's a creator, there are prayer rituals, there is a form of afterlife, and there are also these myths called trickster myths, and the trickster is used to teach children to obey rules and to follow rules and how to be a good citizen and have high morals. Second group are Europeans. These are the people that you have been studying since you were in kindergarten. Um, European society at the beginning of colonization is based on a social hierarchy. You've got the royalty at the top, you've got the king, the queen, then you have the lords, then you have the, uh, the vassals or the commoners, and then below that you have the peasants, and then sometimes you get even below that slaves. Most of the Europeans, up until fairly recent times, live an agricultural lifestyle. There are only a couple of large cities, some towns. You can think Paris, London, Rome, um, Moscow. Those are about the only big, big cities. Maybe Berlin, Vienna, Austria. But by and large, most people are living an agricultural lifestyle at this time. There are kinship groups in Europe, just like there are in the Native American world, but the kinship groups start to weaken. And the nuclear family, meaning mom, dad, and, and children, become more and more important. Um, European religion is based by and large around Christianity. Um, when when the period of colonization starts, the Reformation is just happening. So you're either Catholic or you are Lutheran at the time. And this whole European colonization starts really because of the influences of the Renaissance where people are no longer afraid to ask questions, no longer afraid to, to um, go outside the lines, if you will, and then the age of exploration where they put a lot of the Renaissance ideas into practice. Then you have West Africans. They're going to play a large role in the development of the Americas. Um, there's no one West African culture. It's really hundreds, if not thousands, of different cultural or ethnic groups and they stretch all along the west coast of Africa from the Sahara down into the southwestern African deserts. Uh, basically modern day Senegal, modern day Cote d'Ivory to modern day Angola and Namibia. There are actually a lot of similarities between the western Africans and Native American groups. Uh, one of the biggest similarities is just their kinship groups. They live together with families and they live together with blood relatives. You also get a lot of small-scale farming. You get a lot of hunting and gathering as well. And women are going to be running the farm. Women are going to be 
taking care of small animals and the children while the men are off hunting and the men are off raising livestock. So there's a lot of similarity there with Native Americans as well. One thing that is fairly unique in West African culture compared to European culture is the idea of a matrilineal versus a patrilineal family. In Europe, by and large, the society is patrilineal, meaning that parentage is based upon the father. But in West Africa, parenthood or or your place in life, if you will, is based upon your, your mother. What that means is if you inherit anything, you inherit it from your mother's side of the family. If you marry, you move into your wife's house. Um, if you are a tribal leader, you're not so much worried about what happens to your son as you are worried about your sister's son because that's going to be the one who uh, is the next to lead, the next to be in charge. These villages are going to be ruled by priests, ruled by nobles, and in many West African cultures, these nobles were referred to as big men, big men or big man. And generally, a, the big man is whoever is the most powerful male in town. They are able to maintain power by giving away gifts or giving away influence, if you will. There is a mix of religions in West Africa. There are native animism religions, and these native religions either are replaced by or intermix with Islam to create something new. Now, the first video is very, very short. And for the first lecture, remember to look at the readings, look at the textbook, answer discussion questions, and look at the quiz and make sure you answer the quiz. And also, once again, because this is a summer course, there is a second video in the lesson two folder that you must watch. But this video is short, sweet, simple. It's going to ease you into this first week. If you have any questions on anything, don't hesitate to ask. I will answer you as quick as I can. Until the next video, have a good day. Bye.